Today, I have an absolute treat for you. I've got Logan Matashami. He's the lead analyst for housingwire.com. You see the article here that I've got pulled up about new home sales. We had the most incredible, in-depth conversation about the housing markets, everything. Um, this guy's on the news all the time. Um, check him out. Check his Instagram out. I'm going to put all the links in the description for you to connect with Logan, Housing Wire, and all that good stuff. I read all of Housing Wire's articles. Uh, they're one of the, you know, most positive mainstream uh, media companies concerning the housing market that I've seen, honestly. And that's why I wanted to have Logan on to get his perspective on the market, on affordability, election year coming up, um, you know, everything. And he, we, we, we spent a good hour together. And this is just a very, there's, there's not a second in this interview where there's not some incredible information being talked about. So, I hope you enjoy it. Um, let me know in the comments what you think, and let's just dive right in here. Enjoy. Logan. Ricky, how you doing? Good, man. How you doing? Doing good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for um, carving out some time. No, no problem. Yeah. You in Cali? Uh, Irvine, California. Yeah. Nice, nice. Let's dive right in, man. Um I've seen a lot of stuff. I mean, I read a lot of you guys' articles and, um, you know, you got the 8%, you got prices, you got <laughs> unaffordability through the roof, um, you know, inventory shortage, mortgage delinquencies. Let's dive in, bro. <laughs> yeah, I got all the data. <laughs> Tell me your thoughts on the whole, the whole thing right now. You know, when I, when I think of the housing market, um, and a lot of this ties to my work over the last uh, uh, 15 years, years 2020 to 2024 was going to be this once in a lifetime event because the demographics for housing during this period was the best ever. And what I mean by demographics and housing, housing economics is very simple. Uh, we rent, we date, we get married three and a half years after marriage. We have kids, uh, people that make good amount of money uh, typically buy homes. Well, years 2020 to 2024 had the biggest housing demographic patch ever in history. Uh, ages 28 to 35 is the biggest. So when you put move up buyers, move down buyers, cash buyers, investors, first time home buyers all together, you're going to have very good replacement uh, buyer demand. The only concern here was inventory has been slowly moving lower and lower for over 10 years. And if housing breaks out like it should, home sales should be uh, rising during this period, it could force us into a very low active listing environment, which it did, and prices escalated out of control. We had too many people chasing too few homes. It wasn't like the mm -hmm. housing bubble years where we had massive credit and sales boom, and then all of a sudden a major uh, collapse in sales and rising inventory. It's much different right now. So the the structural dynamics could not be any different than what we saw from 2002 to 2008. So it has some benefits for homeowners. Homeowners are doing great. Fixed yeah. debt costs, rising wages, uh, especially against inflation. The 30-year fixed mortgage was the best hedge on planet Earth against uh -huh. not only inflation, but also against that aggressive Federal Reserve. But what that's done is it's kept uh, uh, inventory lows as most sellers or buyers and as rates uh, uh, escalated out of control recently, a lot of those people are just sitting at home waiting for rates to come lower. You you said it's not really comparable to, to 2000 to 2008, right? Is there a time in history that is kind of comparable to what's happening right now? You know, a lot of people like to uh, uh, bring this back to the late 70s. Uh, in the late 70s, existing home sales went from 2 million to 4 million. Inflation uh, took off. Mortgage rates went up higher. A lot of people had uh, lower mortgage rates than that was being uh, provided. And home sales went from 4 million down to 2 million. We have somewhat similarities. The only reason I don't like to compare this, this period of time to any other period of time is because after 2010, when qualified mortgage laws came into place, uh, the home buyers now in America, uh, the homeowners themselves, have never been in any, uh, have, have had the best financial profiles we'll ever see in our history. And our family has been in banking since the late 1950s. The amount of uh, the unbelievable positive cash flow that they have. And when we talk about cash flow, you buy a house, 30-year fixed mortgage, your wages rise every year. Naturally, your housing cost becomes a little bit less to that. 
we've had three refinancing waves since 2010 in 2012, 2016, 2020, and 2021. So people are living in their homes longer and longer from 1985 to 2007, it was five to seven years from 2008 to 2020, 23. It was, it's been 11 to 13 years, depending on who you listen to. Some people live in their homes 15 to 18 years on average. Now I've lived in my house for 20 years. So where people's wages are right now to their housing costs looks, it's great for them. Yeah. Uh, so it can prevent some uh, natural sellers in a market, especially when rates go up. So you could kind of refer this to the 70s uh, because we had the mortgage rate inflation issue. But I would say that the homeowner profiles now have never looked this good. Uh, also, over 40 percent of homes have no mortgage either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like 45 percent or something. Um. So we're in this predicament with low inventory. And I think the big question is, is where's the inventory going to come from? I haven't heard anybody on the news or any gurus really give a, 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 a an answer that made a lot of sense. So what we have seen in the data in the last 13 years, the only way inventory actually grows, uh, higher rates creates weakness in demand in the days on market grow. Mm. And that can facilitate more inventory. But to give everyone a good example, let's use the NAR's inventory data. And this is a topic that nobody ever talks about because I, I don't think people remember this. Back in 2000, active listings were 2 million. Yeah. In 2005, it was 2.5 million. We had rising sales and rising uh, uh, inventory uh, because the credit markets back then, people could freely list their homes, buy another one. There was no restraints. Mm. Now it's a little bit different because of qualified mortgage, everyone has to qualify before they even list a home. Uh, right. So inventory can only slowly grow with weakness and demand. It's not much really. Uh, last year was last year was such an anomaly of the year. We started the uh, in March of 2022. We only had 240,000 single family homes available for sale for a country of 335 million Crazy. and 157. So prices were escalating out of control. But when rates started to grow up, the slope of the inventory curve on our Housing Wire weekly inventory data was was rising faster than normal. And then when rates started to fall, November, December, January, the structural dynamics of housing change, we go back to a stable demand and a low inventory situation. So inventory can really only come through as long as the economy is expanding, uh, kind of weakness in demand, slow growth, something to that nature. And even today, as we talk, um, almost Halloween, in weekly inventory data, still negative year over year. Uh, new listings data, which I think is a very new concept for a lot of people. New listings data has been trending at the lowest levels ever recorded in history since mid-July 2022, right? Because yeah. most sellers are buyers. It's a supply is a function of demand. So it's just preventing inventory to grow in a normal uh, a pace with uh, uh, demand being this soft. So it is a, how I call it, a savagely unhealthy housing market in that context not because yeah. homeowners are in trouble or inventory skyrocketing. It's just yeah. homeowners are doing good, right? So, so what? So, so what has to happen to like get back to a normal, not unhealthy market? Well, inventory just getting back to 2019 levels would actually get us back to days on market being over 30 days, and that gets us somewhat normal. And there's only two ways that happens: weakness in demand, or you create a job loss recession where we call forced equity sellers. Uh, mm -hmm. The foreclosure story, is, it, it's, it's, it's a funny topic. Th foreclosure data right now, 30, 60, 90 days are near all time lows. Yeah. You know, so this whole concept of forbearance was going to crash the market. I, in summer yeah. of 2020, I created the term forbearance crash bros. Uh -huh. right? It's a bunch of professional grifters on YouTube. But yeah. forbearance itself crashed. So until you have a job loss recession, there is literally no reason for homeowners to sell their homes or 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 move in the sense to where they have to pay a higher cost of living. Mm. Uh, so a job loss recession could create forced equity sellers, but the foreclosure process, whenever the job loss recession happens, it would take minimum, and I'm being graceful by saying minimum, nine to 18 months before that supply even hits the marketplace because you got to go through a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day, notice of default, there's judicial states, non-judicial states. In some cases, it'll be two to three, even four years. So that, you're not going to get that supply anytime soon. But if a job loss recession does come because so many people have nested equity and, and uh, uh, um, enough 
enough equity to sell their house without going underwater, that can provide some inventory faster. But outside of that, the only thing we've seen is weakness in demand, days on markets growing. That's it. Mm -hmm. It has been notoriously slow this year. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that a job loss recession is a possibility or what are, what are you right now? Think? Job. Yeah. Jobless claims are still way too low. I mean, part of my economic labor work post COVID-19 was, you know, really talking about how the labor dynamics are going to be structurally different this, this time around. I was the only person on planet earth talking about job openings are going to get to 10 million, you know, just because job openings itself have been slowly rising since 2014. And then here comes the baby boomers leaving the workforce, uh -huh. right? So it has the potential to get up to uh, uh, 10 million here. It got up to 12 million. So uh, we have replacement consumers, but we also have replacement workers. But if your baby boomer leaves and then a younger person comes in and takes your job, wash. So the demand for labor, if it keeps on continuing to grow, because productivity has been terrible here uh, and around the world really for a long time, uh, the manual need for labor will keep those people uh, employed longer than people think. So until jobless claims, the four week moving average, that data line comes out every Thursday, 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, until that number gets above 323,000, it's roughly at 200,000. We don't even mention the word job loss recession. So we're far from that. Um, you know, the Fed would like to create more labor supply, uh, but sh sh raising short-term rates can only do so much. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there is a credit event and credit deteriorates. The commercial uh, uh, loans eventually come due. Yeah. Uh, but until jobless claims rise, the labor market is still firm uh, in that regard. So basically you're telling me that there's not really a path to more inventory. There's, there's not a fast path to inventory yeah uh what we what we track every single week at the end of at the end of friday we track the weekly new listings data and active inventory data um and new listings data is to me forming a bottom but it's forming a bottom at the lowest levels ever so until mm -hmm. that data line grows it's very hard to get what we call escalation inventory or inventory growing above trend uh, and even to, even today, the NAR or our data or a lot of people's data, uh, active listings are still uh, uh, near all-time lows. So you have to think of it as sellers or buyers, that natural supply and demand equilibrium has changed after 2010, and it's just been a struggle. We've been slowly moving lower for so many years. Nobody paid attention because everybody keeps on talking housing 2008, and we didn't have the credit backdrop then. So it's just it's just been a slow ride. And the builders... You know, today the new home sales report came out. And when I speak at events, I go, does anybody know how many new home sales are available for sale today? Mm -hmm. Nobody answers. And I say 75,000. That's it. A country of 335 million, 157 million working. 75,000 homes are available for sale. The builders do not oversupply a market that goes against their uh, uh, business model. So they manage their supply. Yeah. And right, right now they just pay down rates. They move product that way. New home uh -huh. sales are growing this year. Mortgage purchase application data is falling because that divergence is because the builders have a sub 6% uh, mortgage market. And if we had a sub 6% mortgage market for the existing yeah. home sale, sales are 650 to 725,000 higher than what they are today. You think builders, and I, I, I put this on a video, people really trashed me on it, um, that builders kind of do it on purpose like they're not overbuilding on per they want to get too oh, far oh ahead. yeah it's it's it's, it's they're controlling big... price they're controlling yeah. inventory they're controlling the whole thing there's another institution that does this opec mm -hmm. you know they held the whole control right. so the, the builders have realized you know hey listen we need to manage this because in a sense think of their business model they take a contract for a person on that day and then they have to build the house for whatever 12 15 uh -huh. months and then that person has to qualify you know with the same rate and what happened is uh -huh. you know rates escalated so here they're just they have their profit margins are so much higher now than they were in the last decade so they can pay they can eat it on the mortgage rate side and uh they didn't have this advantage in the last decade but now they do because mm -hmm. inventory is so low and rates are so high that they're peeling off some existing home buyers and say listen this home is going to be ready in three weeks 
we could get you a sub 6% mortgage rate all day. So mm -hmm. uh, they're managing because that's their business model. They are here to make money. They are not the March of Dimes. Yeah. Money is what they need to make. So, well, some people say, well, if they could build more, you know, they would because they want to make a bunch of money. But yeah, that's the yeah, whole point is they're controlling they're controlling the, the whole game. The the builder's biggest competition is the existing home sales market, and that marketplace mm -hmm. is much bigger than them. And it's older, cheaper homes, so mm -hmm. they don't put their heads down and build, build, build. Also, construction productivity has been terrible for five decades. I mean, we oh, st no still doubt. build homes with nails and hammers. We were doing that in the fifties and sixties. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the U.S. housing market it costs a lot to build a home. It doesn't mm -hmm. really go down in any meaningful fashion. So the builders have to build it with inflation and and make it uh, work for their business model. I bought five DR Horton homes here in the past 90 days or so, all investor loans, 30 year fix through their mortgage company for 5.9% interest, yeah. you know, 5,000 closing costs paid, all kinds of stuff. You know, I was like, yeah, they, let me take a couple of those. They are efficient sellers. They do what they need to do to sell product. They, I mean, think of this. Think of the builders as they sell homes like they sell a commodity where the existing homeowner has to sell their house, find somewhere else to live, make sure they could qualify. They have the human element. Builders are just build it, make it, sell it, make as much money next. Come here, yeah. on and on. And on. So there's, there's a completely different type of uh, uh, atmosphere in terms of how they uh, sell homes and where an existing home seller is. Yeah. So what do you, what do you, I mean, a lot of people have been priced out of the market prices, you know, interest rates, the combination of the two, um, you know, there's, there's this crowd of people who can't afford that should buy right now, I think. Um, and when interest rates drop, okay, here's what I think is going to happen. you got the trade up seller who's going to add inventory to the market, but also take one off the market. So it's a net even for active listings. Then you got the first time home buyers that come in that bring active listings down without adding anything to the market. I feel like inventory could hit a new all time low. That's that's how you described it is how I describe it at events. 90% mm -hmm. um, of millennials or first time home buyers finance their their homes through a mortgage. Mm -hmm. The boomers are under 50%. Mm -hmm. So whenever mortgage rates fall, people think, well, if mortgage rates fall, inventory will skyrocket. And yeah. mortgage rates were at 3% in 2021. New listings data was trending at the lowest levels then. But mm -hmm. the first time home buyer is not part of that equation because they're not offering you the house. But right. they are the biggest demographic patch. So now you can understand my concern about inventory. Here's right. the biggest housing demographic patch ever in history. And they don't offer homes, so they take those homes away. So the seller is a buyer, that's washed. Then the first time home buyer comes in and they slowly pick up those homes. So traditionally, lower rates means flat to lower inventory, not higher. Uh, the only variable that could change that if, if lower rates are coming due to recession, but recessions are, are short term events in the sense they're not protracted five, 10 year cycles. So that could only do so much. And this is kind of the problem. The only other thing I could think about is something that would happen, you know, 10 years down the line when a lot of the baby boomers will pass off. You know, none of us are Dorian Gray. Basically, we, nature wins. They die off. They give their homes to their children. What their children do with the homes uh, uh, is questionable. But right now, you, we can see this, that sales are down. But inventory is is still near all time lows, and that's a function of homeowners being in good in a very good spot. In two thousand eight, there was four there were four million listings. Uh, we had four million transactions. Do you feel, and we're going to have about four million transactions this year? Okay, but we have under a million listings. Do you feel like if we had more inventory, that we would have more transactions? Because a lot of people are comparing this to two thousand eight, like it's apples to apples, where. I don't really, I, I feel like we would have more Im, more transactions if we had more inventory. So the difference between now, the inventory channels now, is that the spike that we saw in 2005 to 2007 from two and a half million active listings to four million is what I call forced credit sellers. So one of my more popular charts that I that I show people around the country is I show the foreclosure bankruptcy data. And you know we had two two laws changed in the early part of the century. We had the 2005 bankruptcy reform laws and the 2010 QM laws. But people don't remember this: foreclosures and bankruptcies were rising in 2005, six, seven, and eight. 
Yeah. All before the job loss recession. Yeah. So those are forced credit sellers that could not buy a home. So uh -huh. the seller that becomes a buyer is not part of that equation. They were selling was, and renting. They were selling and renting or living uh -huh. with their family. So yeah. that was the first time in history. And a lot, lot of times I like to do the NAR charts going back to 1982. And I draw these lines to show people that was the anomaly event, but it would make sense if we had a massive surge in foreclosures and bankruptcies before the job loss recession. And then the job loss recession happened after that. And then you have another wave of foreclosures. So the inventory channels back then broke the standard between two to two and a half million active listings were sellers or buyers. So I always, I always take that period out of the equation because so you think back then two and a half million listings was really the true inventory. And then it got inflated by the, if you, yeah, if you go back to 1982, if you take the 2008 credit crisis out of the equation, naturally we're between two to two and a half million and that seller and buyer equilibrium keeps the inventory levels at that stage. Now people go, well, how can we have so many home sales in 2021 with active inventory so low? And I think this is the other part of the uh, uh, discussion that people don't have. We sell homes a lot faster now. Mm -hmm. So unless the home is you know, in, in the marketplace over 45 days, it doesn't really get accounted in the active listing. So yeah. you get a home, you get a buyer right away, you put it, offer in. We can close loans in 10 to 11 business days now. So it's yeah. not like it was in the before. So just the process of homes being closed faster uh -huh. also keeps the inventory. So if the homes get an offer within the first week or two, it's not going to be created in the active inventory list. The active inventory can grow with weakness and demand and days on market growing. But even today, the days on market per the last uh, existing home sales report is 20 days. Um, yeah. Let's say back in 2011, it was 105 days. So the days on market are just too 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 low for active inventory to grow in any meaningful way. The when interest rates come down and and this scenario I'm talking about with the trade up seller selling and then buying another one and the and then the first time home buyers that can you know that have been able to afford at whatever those rates come down to, and, and inventory or you know active listings drop. That, that's what I think could possibly happen. And, and, it, Active it listings every to time. new all-time low, okay? Mm -hmm. But in that process, transactions probably hit 5 million, you know, 5 million plus. There's going to be so many more transactions. You're going to yeah. say, well, how did this happen? Inventory is dro dropping, I, but it's the turnover. A really good uh, uh, data line for this to even show this example was last November. November, December, and January, mortgage rates went from 7.37% down to 5.99%. Mm. During those three months, for the majority of the time, purchase application data was positive on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, it wasn't booming or anything, but just that three months of lower rates gave us one of the biggest month-to-month -month existing home sales print ever recorded in history, mm. uh, not tied to COVID or some kind of crazy event. We went from 4 million to about 4.55 million. We do not have like half a million uh, sales in a month, but mm -hmm. that happened and inventory was still low. And actually because that demand was coming in, what it did is it took inventory off so much that we had the latest start in the seasonal bottom of inventory ever in history in 2023. It was April 14th. Usually what happens is inventory bottoms out in January. And then at the end of January and February, we see the spring inventory increase. And then mm -hmm. we see this uh, uh, the decrease in inventory go into the uh, fall and winter. But just that three months, because home sales are so we really it's really rare in America to go under four million monthly sales in existing yeah. home sales. We, we, we yeah. had it for you know a few months in 2008. We just barely broke underneath here. But rates just getting down to six percent gave us one of the biggest month to month sales reports. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Sellers are buyers, first time home buyers come in. This is how the inventory channel has worked really uh, after 2010. What, what do you guys do forecasts? Do you guys forecast what year, the next we, year? I, I do a yearly forecast at the end of the year. And a lot uh -huh. of my work is based on forward looking housing data, which is every week we talk about new listings, active listings, where the 10 year yields going, where what economic data, because one of the things I did last year is 
starting from November 9th, the housing market dynamic shifted, right? Rates started to fall, forward-looking data started to get better. And what we used to talk about is like, none of you are going to see this until March and April. Because, you know, if purchase application data grows, it takes 30 to 90 days for that to hit the uh, data line. The sales data line is another month or two. So by the time, you know, uh, uh, March and April comes, you can see we're no longer crashing in sales. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how we view it. We, we we call it the housing wire tracker every weekend. We, we give people the most up-to-date information. So they're not stuck with old sales data because you could get positive and negative there and be behind the curve. And every single year we do forecasts, we do bond yield channels, mortgage rates, uh, things that specifically tie to the housing market uh, uh, and, and the structural dynamics. Because housing is one of these sectors that disproportionately gets hit negative when the rates rise, even with a good economy. I mean, in 2022, we had 4 million jobs created and we had the biggest crash in home sales ever. Yeah. When rates fall, housing is disproportionately impacted in a positive way. Mm -hmm. uh, in COVID-19, uh, I wrote a COVID-19 recovery model for Housing Wire April 7th, 2020. I just started working for them. So they were thinking, do we really want to publish this? It was designed mm -hmm. to show the recovery of housing within a few weeks. Uh -huh. you know. And uh, um, again, that's a lot of forward-looking data. And even in the summer, I remember telling people, existing home sales are going to go positive. And people go, there's no way. There's 20 to 30 million people. So how I explain this is, Back then, people told me there's no way home sales could come back because 20 to 30 million people are employed or unemployed, and we had 5 million in forbearance. I go, yeah, that's cute. I got 133 million people behind me still working, and rates are at 3%. Yeah. My, my army's bigger than yours. Yeah. So when the next job loss recession happens, remember that there's 157 million people working right now. We mm. cannot possibly lose enough jobs to really impact that much people working. It's the highest workforce we've ever had for a housing market. And the demographics for housing are very good. So assume a two to three million job loss recession, uh, the Fed gets uh, kind of what they want in a sense. That's still 154 million people working with lower rates. Yeah. So, so when the next recession happens, always be mindful of that because that's what happened in COVID. The 133 million, you don't need a lot of sales versus to the workforce to get housing going, especially when you're working from this low level. So we were 4 million back then in 2020. We shot right back up very quickly. Here, we, we don't have that kind of COVID-19 recovery, but demand can pick up because the bar is so low, we can all trip over it. Yeah, I think we have historic uh, pent up demand that we've never seen before. Uh, on the sidelines in April 27th or 28th of 2020, I put out a video and I said the name of it, it's still there on YouTube. Um, real estate market is going to surge, you know, more than we've ever seen in our life as soon as the economy reopens. Mm -hmm. And my thoughts were the, the stimulus, but also the retraction. Of, I, I felt the demand, like the retraction of transactions and pending deals. And I was like, man, it, Something through it. As soon as May came, the purchase application data was actually recovered. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, by June and July, we were already back. Uh, and that's why we always try to focus on purchase application. It's a forward looking uh, indicator for housing, 30 to 90 days. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was the sharpest V shaped recovery uh, uh, in history. And a lot of this is the demographics for housing are, are better now. And the credit markets are better now. You know, in, in 2000, Eight, the credit markets were the, the housing market needed credit to expand in, in such an accelerated rate. The mortgage availability credit index went up from like 200 to 900, and then it collapsed from 900 to 100. And we haven't mm -hmm. gone anywhere for 13 years. So we're, yeah. we're not relied on exotic loan debt structures to push housing demand. It's simply boring 30 year fixed mortgages, right? Yeah. So the credit markets can't get tied unless Freddie and Fannie were like publicly traded companies, again, not under conservatorship. So that's not going to happen either. But it does need lower rates and lower rates with duration, games back on. We got a glimpse of that last November, December, and January, and it gave us one of the biggest month to month sales print. Imagine 157 million people working with sub 6% mm. rates. Oh, we see it with the builders and the builders are growing sales 22% yeah. year over yeah. year because they can work in that environment. The existing home sale market has a lot bigger uh, buyer pool than they do. Yeah. So there, I want to know what you, 
would tell people that you know, have been priced out of the market, you know, are we, is this a new world we're living in or wherever we can go back? I don't, I feel like we're in a new world, but I, I don't know that this is a good thing where prices keep going up and unaffordability, unaffordability gets worse and worse and worse. Cause I feel like we're dividing this top 1% of people and you know, it, it's like, it's a, it, it was the biggest concern for years, 2020 to 2024. And I, the reason I say this is that if you look at Canada, Sweden, Norway, Australia, all these other countries, they had much higher home prices versus uh, you know, disposable income than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. And we've got the bigger demographic pool. So uh, unfortunately this can, you know, uh, we, we, we don't get the 30 to 40% price crash that we had after 2008 to mm -hmm. get affordability down. And you got to remember back then we had lots of inventory and affordability was great, but the credit markets were broken and the demographics weren't that good back then. Here it's the exact opposite. We have good demographics, not a lot of inventory and rates are high. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, hopefully over time, what occurs is that the growth of prices cools, wages keep rising every year. You get some better equilibrium with wage growth and prices and hopefully yeah. more inventory and more choices. That's that's where I think you it, it's a more plausible situation. As long as price growth is cooled down to allow wages to kind of come back up, um, it should work. Now for me, I, mean, I was so worried about this, this five-year period that I said, as long as home prices only grew at 23% for five years, we would be okay. <laughs> right. 4.6% nominal. And then I was like, every media report, everything on end of 2020 and 2021, I was like, oh God, it's about to take off. This is not a good thing. Um, but in this case, home prices got past that by the summer of 2020. It was 2021. We were already at 30% there. So the fact that the growth rate is cooling down positive and wages grow, we could find a better equilibrium a few years from now. But that's as long as price growth remains calm and cool. And that's good. That's the most positive story. Like I'm, I'm such a pro supply person just because we want more choices. But the fact, one of the positive stories is that the price growth has really cooled down and, and, and we're, we're, it just takes time to get wages. And, and also we have to remember that home buyers have a different kind of financial profile than renters. One third of, you know, the, our, our workforce are, are somewhat lifetime renters unless they get married. Dual household incomes uh, are, are really, uh, uh, a powerful potion against any kind of housing inflation story, but slower growth of prices, wages grow. You'll find a better equilibrium a few years from now, but we are stuck here. And this is why I said, this is housing market is savagely unhealthy, not for mm -hmm. the reasons of back then. It's just too many people chasing too few homes. Yeah. And even today, the days on market is 20 days with demand yeah. near 21st century lows. So if, if rates come down, I, I, it sounds like we're on the same page. Inventory is going to come down and prices are going to go up. Prices will go up. It should not have the same impact like we did in 2020, 2021, just because rates, if rates got down to 3%, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a whole different ballgame, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if rates get down to 3%, I think we have 50 million uh, uh, additional home buyers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, into the mix. And now at 8%, that 50 million number is down to 20, 20 uh, 22 million. But if rates just get to six, six and five, five to 6% yeah. is, is that sweet equilibrium. Uh, if rates got down to 3%, that, that would, to me, that's again, the savagely unhealthy, too many yeah. people chasing too few goods and prices can escalate. But we we shouldn't see those kind of uh, those kind of gains anymore. We're between five to six percent mortgage rates. Uh, uh, that was a that was a sub four percent uh, phenomenon where prices were. But we will see know. increases, right? Like uh, you know, three to five percent a year, or something like that. You know, some something to where adjusting to inflation would be you know flat to slightly higher. You know, on on a on a real terms, you see very little growth. On a nominal terms, you would you would see growth still if rates. I mean, it's it's simple. If rates fall down, demand picks up, inventory is low, prices increase. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, it's just the growth rate of seeing twenty percent home price growth. No, I mean that. Yeah, that, sure, that, sure. That was like my three percent. My point is, is that because of that, right? Well, is it better to keep rates higher longer to kind of prevent <laughs> that? price growth and the Here, kind of like here's, people get acclimated to higher rates and so here, forth. Here's the thing. The, the higher rates for longer, the, the fed doesn't really target housing directly right. because their, their inflation is rents. 
Yeah. So and uh, I'm not uh, I'm not referring to the feds with their yeah. little higher for longer quote. Yeah. I'm just saying like mortgage rates, wouldn't it be better? And what I fear, Logan, is that when the Fed says we're done raising, where it, where it's now certain that that spread of the 10 year and the the 30, you know, gets back maybe not back to normal, but it eases a little. And even if the Fed doesn't lower rates, if they just say we're stopped, we're we're done raising for now, we'll see what happens. You could see mortgage rates come down well, in like a mortgage, of mortgage. Yeah, mortgage rates could come down and by the spreads. But usually, what happens when the Fed is done hiking and everyone believes that bond yields rally and mortgage rates go lower? Uh, that hasn't mm -hmm. occurred right now. So, uh, that's the one difference, even though if some people agree or disagree, the Fed is almost done. When the economy gets weaker, though, 10 year yield falls, mortgage rates get, get lower. If the spreads get better, that's your sub 5% mortgage rate, you yeah. know, the 10 year yield yeah. getting, getting to, you know, just, uh, uh, near 3%, but we are, we're far from that sub 5% conversation, but five mm. to 6% mm. in that area, you can see that. And we see it, you know, in the, in the new home sales sector, they're selling homes, but they're, it's not like prices are booming for them, uh, mm. in that, in that light. So that would be like a, a sweet little equilibrium for the existing home sales market. Uh, and again, I think a lot of things with, with mortgage rates, people don't understand global bond yields matter a lot too. So it's, we have a global market where global yields are so much higher than they were. We used to have like trillions of dollars in negative yields. We don't have that anymore. So in that context, uh, it, it's hard to get back down to, to lower rates unless the global markets start to see real deflationary uh, issues and then brings uh, rates down altogether. What's your thoughts on, cause you've studied the data. What's your thoughts on um, election year, um, you know, type uh, behavior in the market? You know, if inflation was a problem, the Fed doesn't care if it's election or not. You know, it's mm -hmm. just that, that their job. Now that the growth rate of inflation is falling, I don't think anything really changes. They were going to stop hiking anyway, mm -hmm. uh, even if there was no election next year. They, they yeah. kind of got to their point. How I explain that is that the Fed, the Fed now finally believes they're in very restrictive territory because the growth rate of inflation is, you know, falling and and rates are so much are are higher now than inflation that real yields are now restrictive for them. So they're kind of in a historical spot here where the economy has to deal with really restrictive rates. This is why some of their Fed presidents were trying to talk down the bond market in the last two to three weeks because the ten-year yield rising makes it more restrictive under their own model and they kind of don't want it to get too much so they have to cut rates faster than normal so they would prefer probably the 10 year yield never get above five percent mm. uh, and just let inflation kind of slowly work itself lower another big difference in now in 2008 right the the institutional buyers you know, they kind of emerged out of 08. Um, um, Blackstone started buying and then these other institutions started to follow suit until it got to the point where we are now. And of course, they've slowed down on buying. Um, but I, I feel like that's another piece of the puzzle in the housing market that we didn't have back in 2008. That's a big factor. Here's the thing. When we break down investor buyer profile, the post-COVID institutional buyers went from 0.4% to about 2.1%. So another thing to talk about scale terms is back from 2011 to 2017, there was over 35 million homes bought. The pension funds and Wall Street firms together were 200,000. It's mm -hmm. like Blackstone owns, I think, 0.02% yeah. of all the homes. It's really so a small number compared yeah, to the overall are, market. They are, they are in it for that single family rental. But investors in general, the mom and pops, mm -hmm. they're the ones that drive most of the volume. Right. Uh, and, and they they have always been uh, part of the sales profile uh, post 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even if they have slowed down to a degree, uh, there's a lot of properties where they're willing to make the time and effort, get them fixed up, either sell them or rent them out. Uh, and if rates go lower, they get back into the ball game uh, mm -hmm. and, and they're still there. So the mom and pop investors to me are like the real show. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they have not shown to uh, 
uh, a slowdown when demand gets better. Some have pulled back, but you know there, we have a lot of people that buy like vacant homes, pe- homes that nobody wants to own or buy, mm-hmm. fix them up and rent them out. And uh, they're, they're still there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but if rates fall again, you, those investors get more and more active. So again, yeah, that's why, I, that's why, yeah, that's why I would say move up buyers, move down buyers, cash buyers, investors, first time home buyers. That's how you should look at the housing buyer profile. And they're always there. Uh, so really rates fall, inventory is low. There's your problem with prices. Yeah. Um, like myself, I just bought five DR Hortons. I bought a little empty two bedroom, fix it up, rented it out. Um, and I, I feel like a part of this unaffordability has to do with a single family home to an investor based on the ROI of the rent is worth more to that investor than a first time home buyer who's looking at their debt to income ratio and trying to figure out if they can afford this thing. I think that's a problem. That's where the growth of the single family rental uh, um, variable kicks in, in the sense that if housing is unaffordable for a lot of first time home buyers that might be in the lower bracket income pool, they can still rent, right? And because the demographics of millennials and Gen Z, I mean, millennials and Gen Z are bigger than the total population of Japan. So, <laughs> so I mean, th- these are not small groups. So uh, uh, they, see, they see futuristic buyer demand for a rental. Mm-hmm. Not so much. Of a, so that's why uh, you see that pick up in certain areas. Uh, and again, single family rents are holding up a lot better than apartments. Apartments are dealing with a lot of supply coming into the market over the next year mm-hmm. hitting. And, mm-hmm. you know, you see this, the, the rent decreases in that and, you know, people are offering free, but that the five unit construction is a whole different ball game than single family. Yeah. Um, speaking of rent, I saw a bunch of data around your rents cheaper than buying in a lot of, uh, a lot of markets. Um, like how do you see the whole rent thing playing out? Historically, it's been cheaper to rent, uh, than buy for some time, but right. I, the, the natural home buyer profile just has a, a lot bigger starting base wage pay. So when they kind of get into their first time home buyer age, uh, they traditionally buy a home. They don't rent. There's a there's a group of uh, uh, of our labor force uh, that simply are lifelong renters unless they get married and they become part of a dual household renter. So uh, people go, why are people still buying homes? Well, they can still afford it, uh, uh, and they prefer to own something than renting. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's traditionally families. Right. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of you know, families, you know, don't household formation in an apartment, small, you know, people people like single family homes and like backyards and their base pay is just higher. So mm-hmm. the, the it's cheaper to rent for a, a, a lot of people versus home buying. Uh, but that home buyer uh, bracket of income, it's still functional. And this is why it's really rare for us to break under four million home sales. And also, uh, you know, you don't kind of move down from a single family home to an apartment unless you're at a certain Mm -hmm. age where you just need that. Yeah. Uh, So you always get people that need bigger homes or smaller homes, but they traditionally are buying another property. And with so much nested equity, there's a lot of people whose mortgage payments isn't that much of a problem for them because they're putting so much down. Do you think uh, buying a home is a good investment? I always look at this as housing is the cost of shelter to your own capacity to own the debt. What investors do, uh, either for rental yields or for flipping, that's their own business model. And the successful investors always know what they're doing because they're more experienced than than others. Uh, Mm -hmm. But home generally, home buyers is a fixed debt cost payment in your wages rise. This is Mm -hmm. why millions and millions of homes are bought every single year. Uh, yeah. it's, I mean, we're, we're going to have near 5 million total home sales this year, uh, about 4.1 maybe for existing homes and, and another seven, 800,000 for new homes. So right. majority of that are primary resident home, home owners. And to me, that question is always answered by where you are in your life mm-hmm. right now. And, uh, um, the investor size are very savvy 
you know, they do things with their investments that other people traditionally don't do. And the good ones are just experienced uh, uh, and they know when to pull the lever or not. And that's an individual thing. But what about for a first time home buyer, you know, first buy a house and live in a house. Is that buy, a good investment? You, you buy a house, you get a fixed debt payment for the rest of your life and you build equity. Not even a question. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's not even, I mean, that you, when you look at the the financials of homeowners versus renters, the amount mm -hmm. of, I mean, it's, it's not even yeah. close, like 40 yeah. times more. So right. it's like, those are such different planets that it's almost the easy answer just because of the nested equity. But the real benefit was always that fixed payment, right? And it just, it just now showing itself because all these other countries, they have short-term loans. They don't have Freddie yeah. or 30 or 50. Right. You have people in Canada waking up who had a $4,000 mortgage that are going on an 8,000 mortgage, mm -hmm. you know? So we don't yeah. have that here. That's the security of the 30 year fix. Yeah. That's why well, homeowners get, uh, get that. And it really showed itself the last 18 months where stock traders are on margin calls. Everybody's freaking out all the time. Homeowners are just chill. And that was always the benefit. That's the investment you're making. You're investing for a lifetime of something fixed payment that gives you forced equity savings. Not even a question uh, uh, on that. And that's why the data is so divergent between homeowners and, and renters. And it's just, it's a 30 year fixed product. Now there's no more exotic loan debt structures. Speaking of that, and in in the uh, the YouTube gurus and everything, um, some of them will argue with that that oh the th the 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 thirty year fix is the problem with inventory because we're locked into these lower rates and now they don't want to sell. But I think I don't think no system's perfect, and I would much rather have a system where everybody has a house that they're not forced out of or I have to foreclose on or have to double their payment and not have inventory than a market of a bunch of empty homes that's getting foreclosed on. And we have a lot of inventory. I'd rather have this system than, than another system myself. I, I always say boo hoo, the biggest first world <laughs> problem in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. Americans have low total housing costs and we shield. And like you them. said, prices in these other countries are higher, right? Yeah. Than, I than, mean, than you want to talk about the stress in the housing markets are all the countries with short term rates. Yeah. We, we, we are the most privileged society ever first living in America, but to top it all off, we have a 30 year fixed mortgage, which shielded the entire middle class against inflation and high rates. Oh my God. If you wanted a first world problem ever in the history of mankind, mm -hmm. that's it. And I think there's a lot of frustration from housing crash, YouTube fanatics yeah. who are just like, why won't people sell their homes to be homeless? This, yeah, yeah. this damn 30 year fixed mortgage is making everyone's life good. So we well, you know if it was up to them, nobody don't a home. You just oh, would yeah. keep waiting for the market to crash. <laughs> yeah, I, I I always call them the housing bubble boys 2.0. It's for 12 yeah. years. 12 years they've been doing this. And I've been documenting this. And every year they have some something yeah. new. And this one, the Airbnb bust. The funny part is the Airbnb yeah. bust yeah. happened in a year where new listings data was trending at the lowest levels ever in history. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. want to talk about, you know, a group of people who don't track housing data, but do everything for clicks versus people that actually track housing data. So I understand the frustration from housing crash addicts on a 30 year fix, mm -hmm. you know, cause they go, why won't these people sell their homes? They're doing great. Right. Right. So, and that's what we want. Yeah. Once that's what we want. Yeah, that's exactly what we wanted it for. We would not change a thing. This is the benefit and strength of the United States of America and other countries would love. They would trade spots with us in a second, you know, but they have short term rates. I mean, they're talking about 90 year mortgages in Canada now because, wow. you know, because their payments have accelerated and they have to find some kind of loan mod situation. No, we don't want it. Or... We don't even, yeah, we don't want any of that action. 30 year fix is good enough. That's Weird. it. You should go with it. What's the median or average mortgage payment right now? Well, the thing is that because so many people have very low payments currently, um, you know, no, 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 no. If you bought a home right now, if you bought a home now, it, it, it would be about 31, 3,200. Okay. Um, coming from then, which for me in California, even 15 years ago, that sounds really cheap, you know, yeah. uh, but, uh, you know, prices and rates. The thing is that how are, how are we having 5 million home sales with, with, with mortgage, total mortgage payment? Well, wages have increased in dual household incomes. Can, mm -hmm. can can still mm -hmm. uh facilitate that demand yeah so uh you, you know 
we have a few areas of the country that are really expensive and then everywhere else is not as bad you know especially in the midwest uh, 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 in the south but you know, of course california coastal california i mean where i live the median sales price here is like 2.2 million a one bedroom condo in my neighborhood is 700,000 that's yeah. not that's not real america that's coastal yeah, yeah, california yeah. everywhere right. else it's not as bad yeah. uh, and especially when you have the dual household incomes put together uh, uh, it, it still makes sense uh, for a lot of people to buy homes. And, and th that's how I explain how total existing or total sales this year is almost going to be 5 million this year. Yeah. Um. So in, let's say five years, is the median or average mortgage payment going to be more than $4,000? Do you see it continue payments, to increase? Payments, payments tend to always rise. The one thing that changes that variable, if mortgage rates just shoot a lot lower, um, if mortgage rates got back down to 3%, of course, you have the price factor rising, mm -hmm. but the payment factor gets really impacted. So yeah. the only way mortgage payments, in a sense, can fall is mortgage rates fall or you have an escalation of inventory yeah. and home sales, uh, home prices crash. Those are the right. two variables. In a normal situation, it tends to always rise because prices rise, inflation rises, you mm -hmm. know, and rates stay within a range. But if mortgage rates fell itself, that would be the only variable outside of prices crashing, which is it's very hard to have prices crashing on a national level. Uh, and, and that's why the history of nominal home price crashes don't really happen. Uh, uh, 2008 was the one anomaly of it. Uh, even in the 70s and early 90s, we didn't really have like big nominal home price crashes. Real home prices could come down adjusting to inflation, but nominal home prices needs a lot more inventory, distressed sales, something like that to, to, to keep that thing going longer and longer. Right now, we're in the what I want to call the down cycle of the 10 year housing cycles. We had 08, we had 2022 slash 23. We're, we're in the down year of the, the yearly cycle where in the fall it tends to slow down, uh, price days on the market increase, prices mm -hmm. soften, so on and so forth. Is right now the double the double edged whammy of the down moment in the 10 year housing cycle, the down moment in the yearly housing cycle is right now the best time moving forward to buy a home? He, here's the thing. New home sales literally are up 22% year over year because it's a sub 6% market. You get a sub 6% market. It doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what any of us think. Home sales are rising, okay? And in a low inventory environment- Just for the audience, right? Just for the audience. Yeah. When you say sub six, you're just talking about under seven. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in that mortgage rates. Rates getting can increase sales. We, we just saw, I mean, just last year, we saw demand pick up, even with prices where they were when rates got to 6%. But- if mortgage rates come down, demand typically rises. The velocity of the demand rising depends on where uh, mortgage rates uh, stay longer. But uh, rates fall, demand picks up. We see this every single time. Rates rise, demand slows down. Uh, we had the biggest home sale crash. It's really rare. Like I can make an argument that this is the lowest sales level ever in history, just because we have 157 million people working. Mm. Existing home sales at three point. I mean, back when the baby boomers had their their boom in sales, like that was two million. There was mm. a lot less people back then. Uh, mm. Here we went from six and a half million. We're slightly under four, uh, four million. So there's a lot of demand out there that is just waiting for one variable to change, and that's rates. To me, it's historic pent up demand. I don't think we've ever seen pent up demand. Well, we haven't had we or... haven't had this kind of demographic patch sitting and waiting for rates because we haven't had rates really. I mean, mortgage rates went from three to six percent, six to five, five to seven and a half last year. That's not normal. That was mm -hmm. that was such an abnormal year. So uh, there's a lot of upside to sales with uh, uh, falling rates. Yeah, when I go and speak, I'm like, how many people are working with a buyer, or or or, or, or you know, tens or even hundreds of buyers who are waiting on the market to come down, you know, or, or yeah. rates or prices. Everyone's working with massive amounts. Everybody's working with sellers who want to want to up. Like I've got, I know people that need an extra bedroom. Yeah, they can't move because they're locked into four percent rates right now, or yeah. whatever the case may be. I saw a a forecast. I've, I've and I, forgive me, I forget exactly what group it was, um, but they were calling for three point eight million existing home sales next year. 
Uh, they're calling for less. Home I think sales. that was I think that was Goldman Sachs. Okay. Yeah. What what, what what's you guys' forecast on number of transactions uh, for on existing home sales next to, year? To to me, there's a better backdrop next year for mortgage rates to fall. And when that happens, you know, especially if it gets just to six percent, you could be trending up to four point five to four point six two million. But it does need mortgage rates to fall. I think mm -hmm. what Goldman is thinking is rates are going to stay, you know, eight uh, percent uh, and 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 hover around this level for for mm -hmm. a whole year. Uh, you get any lower rates, you're already above four million All uh, right. on the trend sales because we're working yep. from the, we're working from such a low bar. It doesn't really take much even. Uh, and again, I I I use the new home sales as the example. They're up 22% in sales this year. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, that's because of low rates. So uh, it really depends if the labor market gets softer, the 10 year yield should go lower by itself. And then you have this massive group, 157 million people working, and a lot of them that were waiting for rates to fall, they'll go in there. Uh, but it does need that 10 year yield, does need mortgage rates to fall. And the longer it does with duration, it's better for the housing market because you could grow sales. Last year or this year, we just had that one big print and sales were slowly falling uh, after that because rates were rising. You get rates, lower rates with duration, oh, you're easily above over 4.6 million. It yeah. just needs that rate factor to kick in. Yeah. Bro, thanks for your time, man. Um, My hang, pleasure. Out afterwards, hang out afterwards for a sec. And um, <laughs> man, it's, oh, uh, so it's been a pleasure cool. jamming with you about the market and stuff. I love talking to people who actually know what they're talking about. Love. <laughs> <laughs>